It says setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. Mine nice. is streaming. Yeah. Yeah. So Facebook Live. Okay. This is live on Facebook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of our series. Joining us, we just give a little time to set up. There's a little technology issue today. Um, so um, forgive us. Uh, Zoom and Facebook seem to be having a little struggle, but we are here and we do want everyone to join us for this wonderful discussion we're going to have today about racism. So Chrissy, do you want to share about how to do a watch party? Oh, how to do a watch party. Great. So we'll just take a brief commercial on making sure that we do send this out, but we're having a, a difficult Zoom day. I think everybody's Zoom to Zoom. So if you go to the Arundel Patriot, you see live. I clicked on the live and when it said share underneath the share option, you get the, the option to create a start a watch party. So I'm creating a watch party on my own Facebook page. So if you go to the Arundel Patriot, you see the all right, wonderful. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you. So I just want to remind everyone that is joining us on Arundel Patriot um, that the Arundel Patriot needs your support. So please, 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 if you haven't already, please support the work that Arundel Patriot is doing for us. Um, we are a small community media resource and we are continuing to work to build media that shares powerful and empowering content please support the Arundel Patriot by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com and become a monthly supporter of our work so that we can bring more great content to you. And we are gonna go ahead and get started with our Straight Talk About Racism series today. I am joined by some lovely ladies that are gonna introduce themselves to you. My name is Monica Lindsay, and I am pleased to be here with you today. I'm Yasmin. I'm Renee Cantori. Happy to be here. I am Claudia Barber. I'm happy to be here. Mm -hmm. I'm Ali. Thank you for allowing me to be here. <laughs> I'm Carmen. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm Emma Buckman. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Chrissy Hope. Thanks for having me today. Awesome. Now let's get into it. So uh, today there's a couple of things that we want to dive into. Um, we ladies have been uh, really impacted by what's going on in the nation right now and what's going on locally. And uh, we're just going to take a dive uh, with you right here about these subjects that really matter. Um, so first I wanna share a little content with you. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen with you, bear with me. Um, but the latest information coming out about the Ahmaud Arbery case, the situation that happened down in Georgia um, that we were all reeling over the last few weeks. Um, there's been some more information coming out about that um, and a uh, latest um, stream from the video has shown that there were many people who were actually going into that structure over the course of time that um, that house was being built. Um, I'm just gonna share that with you today and we're gonna talk about that as well as we're gonna talk about uh, the Brianna Taylor situation information just coming out recently about uh, the shooting of Brianna Taylor and what's happening with um, that situation in Kentucky with her boyfriend. Um, and our final big thing that we're gonna talk about is uh, the Lieutenant Richard Collins, uh, his anniversary of his uh, murder is coming up soon, um, as well as some impactful court dates. And last week we had Don Collins, his mother with us and she was unable to join us today, um, but certainly that is uh, part, gonna be part of our discussion as well. So I'm just gonna share with you this little video for some discussion. Um, and 
hope this works. <laughs> Hopefully I'm sharing the screen with you all now so you can take a look at this. This was um, the latest. CBS News has obtained new surveillance video related to the Ahmad Arbery case. This video, taken on December 17th, appears to show a man leaving the house under construction. And I just caught a guy running into a um, house being built two houses down from me. Almost two months later, he was spotted in this same house. That incident in February prompted a 911 call from Travis McMichael, who would eventually shoot Arbery. He said he spotted a man on the property. When I turned around and saw him and backed up, he reached into his pocket and ran into the house. So I don't know if he's armed or not, um, but he looked like he was acting like he was. According to the property's owner, Larry English, nothing was taken. And he says the man in the video may not have had bad intentions. In a statement, English's attorney says this young man may have been coming into the property for water. There is a water source at the dock behind the house, as well as a source near the front. There are. So I just want to point that out. He may have been coming in from water. That really got to me. So we're going to talk more about this. But just check out the rest of this um, footage showing that there were additional folks who were also accessing this property. There are dozens of surveillance videos showing people frequently coming in and out of the house, including children. A white couple entered on the day of the shooting. Today, Gregory McMichael. All right. So just seeing that that wasn't just one person entering and uh, that uh, multiple people apparently had entered this property, but it was one person uh, who the McMichaels were certainly concerned about um, entering the property. Um, so I also want to share one other piece with you, just as a point of comparison, because I find it interesting, this situation that happened in Georgia. And then we, we look uh, also um, nationally at this point, and we're also going to be looking at um, Brianna Taylor situation coming out of Kentucky. Let me just get to that. Uh, this is Brianna Taylor. Um, she is the Kentucky EMT um, who was shot and killed in her home by police officers. Um, and this is also national news that's just coming out, but I just wanted to share her picture because, um, you know, if you look at her face, you look at her smile, she's proud of her accomplishment. Um, her contribution is no longer and um, currently her boyfriend um, is having a struggle because of the fact that right now he is being brought up for charges um, for shooting uh, the police officer that entered the home that he was sharing with Brianna Taylor on the <clears throat> evening that she died. He was protecting his home, just like uh, the McMichaels say they were protecting the home in Georgia and um, he ends up being brought up on charges for it, for shooting a police officer in the leg. So uh, we're going to get at that. Let's, let's talk about that. Well, um, I wanted to uh, first uh, address the footage of the Ahmad Arbery story and also uh, address the Brianna story uh, because uh, the, the major uh, focal point has often been surrounded about, of, around video of the construction site. And uh, that may or may not be relevant uh, because the question uh, often is uh, how people are creating narratives, be they false or not false. And the concern that I have is that when the video of the construction site first came out, uh, there was only the video of 
uh, a black male inside and, and not revealing that there were others inside. So I appreciate the fact that you did show some video of other people at that identical construction site. Now, where is the 911 call when those other people entered the construction site? Where is the, uh, they looked in their pockets and they may have have a gun. Where is that narrative in that 911 call? So, you know, the concern that I have, again, is that any one of us are, 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 are likely to be on a jury. And to the extent that the person that's dead is not here to defend themselves is huge because it is a situation where the people who, he, because that person is not here to add to the narrative. They can't say anything about what transpired on that specific day. So that's what makes racism so real is the fact that there is no record of a 911 call when those other people entered that construction site. That's the heart of the root of the racism right there. And then in the Brianna story, it's tragic how she lost her life. Uh, but um, uh, there has got to be some motivation and movement to get uh, uh, reasonable minded people to drop the attempted murder charges because they're bogus charges against Kenneth Walker. Uh, so that uh, again, uh, uh, tends to be uh, some type of flip the script. Uh, let's make it look like it was an attempted murder and you're at the wrong house and the person that you're going after is already in custody. That's crazy. How do you, how do you trump up a, an attempted murder charge in that scenario when the police officers are wrong from the, from the, from the start getting into that, um, uh, that scenario of, of uh, events as it unfolded. So, you know, it's, it, it's very bizarre. So I'd like to jump in on that and that we have this amazing video of a young man entering a building. And, and that was recorded by the property owner that was just a security cam. But then we have this civilian who follows a truck as two white men go out and accost and then murder um, a black man who happened to be Aubrey. We turn around and, and that video is showing us how he literally was murdered. But then we have the Rihanna Taylor Kenneth Walker scenario where, by the way, the Louisiana, uh, yeah, the Louis, Louisiana, no, Louisville. Louisville. Louisville, the Louisville, Kentucky police do not, did not have um, webcams. They don't have chess cams. So there's no recording of this. No knock, narcotics entering in the middle of the night, um, you know, murder of a woman who was sleeping in her bed. So this, this use of video is also becoming very pejorative. And on the note of that, I just want to share with you all real quick, and I know, Chrissy, you were trying to dive in there, but uh, I just want to share with you what the media did uh, with the Breonna Taylor event. Um, so on March 13th, evidently, um, there was uh, the Louisville Courier Journal uh, reported the original news report about the death of Breonna Taylor. And I'm just going to read to you what was written in the media in regards to her death. And then uh, let's talk about that. And Chrissy, I know you had something you wanted to add. This is what the media said. It said a Louisville Metro police sergeant was shot and wounded and a woman was killed early Friday during a narcotics investigation near St. Andrew's Church Road and Doss High School, according to authorities. Officers were at an apartment on Springfield Drive about 1 a.m. Friday serving a search warrant as part of the narcotics investigation, according to Assistant Police Chief Josh Judah. As officers arrived at and entered the residence, suspects shot at the officers, Judah said. Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly was shot in the leg and taken to University of Louisville Hospital, where he underwent surgery and is expected to survive. 
LNPD officials said at a Friday afternoon press conference. A female was shot and killed during the encounter after three LNPD officers returned fire and a suspect was arrested at the scene. Chief Steve Conrad said, she was identified Sunday by the Jefferson County coroner as Brianna Taylor, 26. That's the way it was reported. Tell me what y'all think. That's what I, thank you for reading that Monica, because I was gonna add that piece that it's just, you know, racism is in every aspect, right? Of our um, corporate media, it's in, um, it's, it's underneath the, the aggression of the police officers, right? Even in Brianna's case, I mean, you know, the, um, even to finish that article, you know, the eight bullets, I mean, she was asleep in her bed and, you know, just the aggression that they had by bursting into their um, apartment. So it's, ev it's, it's everywhere. And it's actually here in Annapolis as well, right? I mean, on our front page of the Capitol newspaper just a couple of days ago, there's shootings in Eastport. And it was sort of like the way that they led that story was sort of like, you know, to be continued, right? Like be afraid and, and um, you know, just the whole, um, fear mongering to uh, the whites, right? This sort of, even in the video with McMichael, this sort of, you know, sympathetic, like, oh, he was just being a good citizen, right? He was calling and reporting what he saw when he saw it. And, um, you know, it's that narrative that uh, we, you know, um, that I'm glad to see both the video unpack that, right? Just to even listen to the homeowner um, and presenting what Claudia said, right? Showing the white people in there as well. And where were the, where was the 911 call on that? But, you know, not actually believing everything we're reading in the newspaper. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I, I appreciate you for saying that, Chrissy Holt. Never believe everything you see in the, or, or read in the newspaper. Yeah, the because media. the newspaper in that story that Monica just read really was repeating only what was in the police report. And mm -hmm. the police report can uh, cannot, is only through the lens of people who were at the scene, but it, it has no record of the decedent's version. It has no record of Kenneth Walker's version. And it also has no record of, of, uh, of, um, uh, again, uh, the actual evidence that would be admitted in court. So uh, uh, oftentimes you see slants in news stories, e even uh, credible news sources, uh, because of the exact same thing you saw uh, when Monica Lindsay read that script, she read it, and that news story was solely based on what was in a police report. That's it. That's it. And, and that slant comes out right away. That's the first impression that everybody gets. And the further developments of the story, you have to go searching for it. And certain news media, depending on whatever slant they have, will just show you the first story. They won't show you the developments. And so we all now have in our heads that first impression. Well, and, and I was just thinking, so, I mean, racism is a poison that infects the entire country. And to me, sometimes, like, uh, I don't remember who was saying, but even legitimate news sources, it, it's almost like if the, if the country were a body and it was poisoned by racism, the media can sometimes be the thing that gets your adrenaline going, your heart pumping faster and spreads the poison more quickly. So even, mm -hmm. even the thing, like, like even legitimate news sources, they tend to like to, like people were saying, they like to slant it and they will slant it, whether unconsciously or otherwise, to, to be more in favor of what the typical American sees as okay. And to be against the things that the typical American, again, either unconsciously or otherwise, deems as not truly belonging or not truly American. And I think it's, just, it's, the th I think the problem with this and, and with, with everything else to do with it is that 
it's easy to just look at a news article, think that you understand, and then move on. Because a lot of people whose lives have been easy expect life to be easy, and they don't see past that. They don't see that life is actually very difficult, and is supposed to be. And so they like to be spoon-fed, and they don't question. And that's, I think, the biggest problem is that they don't question and they don't take the time to allow those other experiences to come in to say, well, wait a minute, this might be from the New York Times, but at the same time, that seems pretty bad what they just said. It's really not fair that they wrote it that way. The, that we're all people like, and it's, and to write, write a story one way about one person differently versus another, just because of the color of their skin, more people may be questioning that. But you know, Emma, you raise another uh, excellent point in terms of stories that are in credible news sources or, or perceived to be credible news sources. Let me, let me phrase it that way for a moment, because uh, there's another component to this. Whenever these stories hit the newspaper, it impacts the people who are being written about. So everyone knows Kenneth Walker's name. Now, how does that impact his job opportunities? Who is going to hire him? You know, these types of questions uh, are not necessarily thought about when people are reading newspapers, uh, but when they do go on uh, job interviews, it impacts their careers. And I'd like to enter, I mean, in, um, jump in is because one of the things um, that I know that I read a couple of news stories with Walker was he was literally getting ready to uh, start work um, as a postal service. Uh, worker. And so I think when we're talking about racism in regards to the narrative, like literally, this goes back for the last 400 to 500 years, you know, about the imagery of especially the African American and of course the indigenous too in this country and of what they will do. And I find it interesting because how many stories have you read of the police accidentally kicking in a white person's door and shooting somebody's significant other. You know, you don't hear that. How many times have you seen, um, like even with, um, with Aubrey, you know, with Ahmad of someone white being chased down because they accidentally went somewhere they weren't supposed to go to. And, I'm still at a loss because I have a lot to say, but I'm trying, I done got emotional again because this is very, very emotional regards to um, like, I think it was you, Claudia, that said that, you know, when you put these news stories out, it does impact, a, it impacts a community. And um, the, these things, they do impact us because we recognize as a people of color that if that happened to them, that means that there will only be a matter of time before I know somebody personally that this happens to, if it hasn't happened to already, or it could happen to me, it could happen to my son, it could happen to my daughter, it can happen to my brother, you know? And, well, and, 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 I'll, and, and let me say this, I remember, and I was having this conversation with my best friend. And um, I remember, you know, years ago when me and uh, my children's father, we were having our house built. And I remember us once when I was with my uncle and my aunt and a couple of times when I was my, with my children's father, us, when our house was being built, us catching people walking into our houses. And I'm gonna be, they were all white. Every person that we caught going into our house, they were all white. Now, was I irritated as hell? Yes, I was. Except for the one couple that had a little boy that was riding on his bike through my house. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was going, you know what I mean? He was like riding his bike through my house. And I remember for a split second being like, wait a minute, that's my house. You know what I mean? But then it was a little boy and I was like, is this the kid? But it was the fact of that it is invasive. But I recognized it wasn't invasive enough for me to get upset and get up in arms or whatever. I got a little irritated and then I backed off because I remember thinking it's curiosity. People do that. And the scary part is, is that as I've been watching this narrative with Ahmad going through that house, now it's about him getting water. Again, that's subliminal as if he lacks and as if he doesn't have and that he's seeking something and that he wants something and he might take it. How about as he walked through that house, as I watched white people walk through my house at that time, throughout the process of it getting built, that he was paying attention to the progress. 
because that's what the people, the white people who were walking through my house, they were watching the progress. They wanted to see what kind of house is this woman and her, and her significant other building? What are they creating? How does it compare to what I have? And maybe he was going through and maybe he was thinking, wow, maybe one day I will have this too. This is going to be nice. Because that is what we do as individuals when we see things and we're, we're on this projection in our, this trajectory mm -hmm. in our own life. Mm -hmm. But that's not, the, yeah, there's hope. That's not the narrative he's being given. He's being given as a person who's lacking and he's wanted and he might take. And that's always been the issue for the last 400 years when it comes to the African-American community mm -hmm. is, is what we don't have and what we're willing to do to get it. Even though we are the people that was kidnapped. We are the people that were forced to do these things and to build up for a nation for it to have what it has. But we, we are the ones who now have become the takers and the ones who envy and will kill and murder mm -hmm. for it. And that has become our permanent narrative. And the scary part is, is we have a society um, that needs that needs to hear that. They don't want to hear the truth about Ahmad. They don't want to hear the truth about Brianna, even as the story in the narrative with her is, is that she knew the person who they had in custody. So what? So it's what? All community. Yes. So what? So you know what? what? And, and you know the what? owner made up, I'm sorry, Allie. No, the go ahead. The water, but the, even the owner made up the fact maybe he's thinking about water. But look at how distracted we've got, right? right? Like, like, hey, you know, squirrel, right? Think about this. Look over here, you know, believe this story. And, um, and that's part of the white privilege because we'll go do that, you know? And, and that's part of coloring the narrative, coloring the narrative. Just two years ago, I was convinced to walk into a property under construction. I wasn't comfortable with it, but I was with two other people who very much wanted to do that. Was I feeling nervous? Yeah because I knew I probably shouldn't be there. Did I think somebody was gonna shoot me or even call the police on me? No, I did not think that. That's my privilege as a white person. We, all three of us were white women. Yeah, and I, sorry, if I, I, I just feel like I have to bring up too that I have been trying needing to examine my own white privilege recently too, because um, I am 26. Uh, I am the same age that uh, Ahmad would have been and that Brianna was. And mm. um, walking around my neighborhood, which I was just walking around it recently, and I was just thinking how unsafe I would feel if the color of my skin were different and how privileged I am that I can just walk around my own neighborhood without fear. Like I can do that. But if, if someone, if an African-American family were to move in here, I would feel really scared for them because, and it's totally unfair. And it's, I, I've just had to re-examine that in myself just because I, I'm only 26 and I get to be here and I get to live relatively um, without fear that I'll get hurt just walking down my own street. And that's not, so, that's ev something everyone should feel they have a right to do. And it's sadly for the majority of our country at this point, that's not a reality. But that, but you you brought up an important point because it's that reexamination that we all need to do because oftentimes we don't think about the time that um, many people are pulled over and they might be arrested or spend a night in jail and then after they spend that night in jail, uh, you know, uh, people will will just kind of dismiss that as oh that person uh, was arrested. First of all, there's a lot of stigma attached to that. And not only that, you don't know in that scenario whether or not someone lost their job because they could not get to work the next day uh, or, or something to that effect. When we often see these uh, statistics that show that uh, um, people of color are stopped at a more uh, increased rate than other people uh, in society. And, uh, you know, the reexamination also has to do with uh, oftentimes uh, the narrative that's being addressed. For example, people are looking at Ahmad Arbery's toxicology reports, the autopsy reports. Uh, was there drugs in his system? Everybody wants to know the answer to that. Who cares and how is that relevant to right. anything? You know, uh, the, same, the same thing with, um, you know, 
uh, the fact that they're focusing on the fact that, oh, wait, he went into a construction site. And so what if he went into a construction site? The issue here has to focus on something bad. Uh, uh, may, they're trying to skew this as though it was a burglary when it wasn't. So it, it's that, that, that opportunity to make that reach uh, that uh, uh, makes it very, very uncomfortable for people of color to be scrutinized and examined and uh, exaggerated in a negative way. I think also- um, uh, can I, oh, Go ahead, go ahead, Yaz. Well, just, I just wanna say one thing and then everybody else can, my, what I would like to say is for the folks that are watching right now, um, and I think I may have said it last time too, like I would love for white people to just honestly think about, you know, like Emma was saying, the neighborhoods um, you live in and stuff, you know, are, is there a time that you go, well, you know, I don't want that in my neighborhood. You're okay with everything else. You know, you're, you're not racist. You, you know, that's what you think, but think back, like, why do you live in the neighborhood you live in? And do you get bothered because there might be a neighborhood you're close to, um, you know, like, some people send their kids to um, different schools because why are you why are you unhappy maybe with the school in your district that your kid's supposed to go to like what it, where is it coming from like it's not a good school why you know i just would like people and i think one of the reasons that i wanted to do this you know join in this is that that's what i'd like to bring out the fact that there's lots of people out there that say, I'm not a racist, you know, I'm gonna come out and I will, you know, I'm gonna be protesting for rights, for immigrants, you know, all this stuff. But when you go home, what do you think? Do you care? Like, do you, you know, maybe even subconsciously, are you thinking about, you know, the kids your, ki your children are playing with? I mean, you know, like really look inside and, and if that's the case, why, you know, that's what I have to say. And I agree, like, so what? He could have been in there taking a brick, like one of our friends was doing in a dumpster and got arrested for. So, so what, <laughs> should you die for that? <laughs> I mean, how ridiculous is that? Like, oh, let's see what's in his system. So what? <laughs> so what if he was, if he had smoked, pot or whatever who cares that's but not you, a reason that somebody should be dying but you, you know the the so, NAACP uh does however take a, a more deeper look into how this impacts the community that's why oftentimes the NAACP takes a look at for example the uh composition of the courthouse and oftentimes when we look at that lens, we see, we ask ourselves, is the trial court that would hear such an Ahmad Arbery case or Brianna case, is it an Emmett Till courthouse? And if it looks like anything close to an Emmett Till courthouse, it doesn't belong in society. It's wrong, it's wrong. And to the extent that many of you are here that are Yes, or, or, um, or, or that are part of this panel, Monica Lindsay, Yasmin, you all were at the courthouse when we challenged diversity on the circuit court for Anne Arundel County. Many of you were, were there. So you have been part of the struggle. You have been part of the, the dialogue and the discussion to make sure that we don't have an Emmett Till courthouse. Um, uh, because I just actually saw a movie yesterday that's based on a true story and it's called The Blood Can Sign My Name. And one of the um, uh, actors played the role of Ben Chavis in Oxford, North Carolina, where a similar killing happened. And there was an acquittal, just like in the Trayvon Martin story, there were, uh, 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 a black man was uh, gunned down and uh, uh, his assailants, uh, just like in the Emmett Till story, were acquitted. They were acquitted. And, and that has got to change. Uh, and that's the change that the NAACP advocates for. But I, I'd also like to um, get some, I guess, some feedback from, from Facebook and, and their questions. Um, also, so, I agree with you, Claudia, when it gets to that point, but it's like, 
when we get to that point, we've already lost so many lives and stuff. And yes. Of course, all yes. that has to be fixed. But, but the stuff before, like for me, like I think now all the young black men that are, you know, seeing all this stuff happening, even more than, you know, like years ago, because it's just right out there, like the anger they must feel, right? So how do you, you know, um, um, how do you, you know, like just what's the word, just, you know, how do they deal with this? You know, they're gonna have more anger. So guess what? What's What else is gonna happen, Allie, you know, right? So. Go ahead. I, I know Carmen was going to jump in, and I didn't want to jump in before I, because I wanted to respond to what you said, Yasmin. So I'm going to let Carmen and jump I in. I'm going to respond too. Like, okay. about okay. the whole anger and the fear thing. Yeah. That piece is yeah. huge. Yeah. Go ahead, Carmen. So, so here's the thing we're, we're talking about all of the uh, lower level pieces, if you will. Okay. We're psychoanalyzing videotape of a young man being shot, and then the lack of videotape for a young woman who is murdered and killed. What we have to really talk about is um, we can't let the media or the police off the hook. Mm -hmm. um, there is this whole thin blue line group mm -hmm. and this may be unpopular, but I am a police to police group. The, what the police said about Brianna, and it was really valuable that you read this Monica, was that she was a suspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was never a suspect. Never a suspect. Kind of, Correct. Kenneth Walker was never a suspect. Mm -hmm. The suspect was a alleged drug dealer who was already in their custody. What they were doing was they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and they let themselves off the hook and the media supports that. And then we give credibility to both the media and the police when neither had it because nobody went back. This was from March. From March, she was killed. It's it's on May now before we're coming up with this. Yes. Look at all of the pain that has gone on for this family, trying to get the right narrative out. The right narrative being that this young woman was murdered in her bed by police in cold blood, and they never announced themselves. And her boyfriend, who he pulled out a gun and attempted to protect their lives from people who did not knock, a group of men in plain clothes came into your house and murdered your significant other. As a mother, we, we cannot continue to allow the media and the police to have the credibility they do not deserve and they have not earned because they are causing more and more pain to every single person. And I don't care if you're white, black, red, brown, yellow, and also if it's drugs, this whole drug thing, please. You know what, we are, I'm gonna just say this, we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic and no one's talking about that, how to fix that. That is a medical diagnosis. So if somebody's using drugs, get the medical treatment. Don't go breaking into someone's house and kill somebody. Thank you. Yeah. And well you, said. You, yeah. yeah I, <laughs> uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I have to talk about the anger and the fear part because that is something that gets down to the health of the matter. Mm -hmm. um, you have a whole race of people who every time they see and hear about these incidents are re-traumatized. You're traumatizing us over and over and over again because each time you look at the pictures, you see the news article, that's my baby. That's my 24, 25 year old. That's that's my my my, my nephew. Or so each time it's re-trauma. And then you get the fear piece that when your nephew or your significant other or your child does go out, do you have to worry about what interactions are occurring that are outside of your control? That's like a continuous traumatic war zone feeling for people who have to constantly feel that feeling in the pit of their stomach when their significant others, their family members are out of their vision, out of their sight. I, 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 Ali, I'm gonna pass it to you because I'm emotional and this is a- yeah. and that yeah, and, and that was that's just the key thing is that 
It is a proven fact scientifically, scientific medical fact that just like our indigenous counterparts, African-Americans DNA has been changed. It has shifted since the time of the transatlantic slave trade. We literally carry the DNA of trauma for every since our people were forced off the continent of Africa. I mean, like they've done the studies, like our DNA, our brain patterns have changed. So every time something happens, we are re-traumatized again. And it's more than, and it goes deeper than intergenerational trauma, it's DNA. And now we have to combat not only our own, our own ancestral and our own, the leg, no, we don't, because it ain't ancestral. We now have to only, we have to, we're trying to heal the legacy of slavery. The issue with trying to heal the legacy of slavery is, is that we keep having to trudge through it as we battle and fight for the mere fact is because we are accosted on every site. And I didn't say that correctly, but y'all know what I mean. Like on every front, from the time that we walk out, no, it ain't even walking out the house. It's, it's in our households when we turn on the TV. Everything that is out there goes against what we're trying to do as we heal as a people. And then when we leave, so here it is, you've got Ahmad, he was killed by a civilian, like Trayvon Martin. We don't have the police to protect us. And so it is like, who do we turn to? Like, who are we supposed to turn to when we are being accosted on all fronts? We're being accosted societal-wise, politically, socially, academically, economically, and then emotionally in our mental health. Our mental health, our children, are dying in such high rates because of racism. And that's another conversation that is not being held about how we are dying, our children are committing suicide because of racism. And so this really is a mental health, a public health issue because it's not being addressed. And when we're trying to address it, we are villainized for it. We are a villainized people and we are a victimized people. And we are not only being victimized and villainized as parents, we are trying to figure out how do I protect my child from this? Because we can't protect them from it. What we've been put in the position of, which white people don't have to deal with, is armoring up our children. How do we armor up our children so that they are not beat down? Like Ahmad, it's like, you gotta remember, his family is walking in trauma again. 400 years later, they are walking in personal trauma again. And what about those children? Not the men, not the little boys, the children, because remember the females are gonna be mothers one day. And how am I supposed to trust my neighbors if my uncle or my cousin couldn't even jog down the street? Well, you really uh, raise an important issue about trust. Go ahead, Claudia, I'll go after you. Yeah, yeah, I think that you raise an important issue about trust because uh, in, in the communities, uh, there, you know, there cannot be trust at all uh, when you have incidents like this that happen. Uh, it, 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 it's divisive and it creates distrust among uh, families and, and, uh, and in communities. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of distrust too. Um, and during our prep calls, I sort of stepped into this with white women, holding white women accountable. And when you talked about, you know, even Emma Till, right? Like she lied about that on her deathbed, right? Where is the McManuel's, you know, mom or wife, right? Where is she? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you in, but she's not dead, she's still alive. Right, Carol yeah. Bryan is. Till, the woman who lied on Emma Till, she's still alive. 
Oh, okay. She thought- is, but the but his but his assailants are not. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, where are these? Where my point is, where are these white women? Right? Where where are the parents at Chesapeake High School after all those hate crimes? You know, what's happening with those moms of those kids, and what's happening in that community? You know, we, we touched on this a little bit last week with Lieutenant Collins. You know, where's the monster's mom in Severna Park, right? What happened in Severna Park that the monster, you know, was created and, and uh, you know, killed him at 2.30 in the morning at University of Maryland? And so I think one of the motivators for us to be doing this and to, you know, sitting together live um, is what can we, and we talked about this last week, like what can we do as white women to begin to um, change the narrative and to heal the process? I mean, where where are the wives of all of these policemen, right? I mean, Walker um, actually shot the policeman in his leg. That's not attempted murder, that's defending, right? If he wanted to shoot him dead, he would have shot him. I mean, if he was that close, right? Like, but, but, the women that are living with these men, right? Because I don't think there's a lot of white women out there killing black people, but you guys can actually correct me on that, but I don't know any statistics. I'm going to jump Killing in. them with silence. Exactly. And exactly. I think killing them that. by not speaking <laughs> out and but, killing them by silence. But Monica, I think it's deeper than that. I think the reality of it is, and we're not having this conversation is, they are killing our people with the fact of the things that they do. Their actions kill our men. Their actions get our women beat up. Their actions get our little girls like a couple of years ago in Texas where there's a pool party and the police officer felt comfortable dragging our baby on the street and putting his knee in her back while she had a little two piece on. Their their actions kill our kids and their their support. The issue is, is, is not silence. They support what's happening. Yes, yeah, cinema. And we're yeah, and we're not having yeah. this conversation. We've been giving white women a pass for a way pass. damn long. You know, we keep wow. saying white man, white man. If you notice, I don't say white man. I say white people because I recognize and I understand the history of even enslavement. Like even when we talk about slavery, and I know you all already know this, but I know our people out here who are paying attention to us may not know this. Because we always think of white men in the ones in control during the time of enslavement. It wasn't like that. It was white women who had controls and the paper trail of, 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 of the quote unquote enslaved people. It's they were, it was their dowry. All right, they're making laws to protect the white woman because they are killing our children. They're killing our ch- children in large numbers. And so I think that it's where's the white women. The white women are doing what most people in their society do. They stand by their man. And so I think that this is a conversation that white people are going to have to start having with one another. You know what I mean? Just like we in our communities have always held each other accountable. It ain't saying it all works all the time, but we have these hard these hard conversations in our community all the time about the roles of the man and the woman and what that looks like and what our problems and issues are. White people are not having those conversations. And I think a lot has to do with it is because now you're gonna challenge your own system and your own comfort and everything that you have and your status. And what does that look like? Because even if I'm a white woman, I'm beside my man and I may not agree with him, but I also recognize to a degree in our world, he may be right. Because if I allow the black man, the indigenous or whatever brown people to come up to me, what does that mean for my placement in society and my importance right. and my privilege? What does that look like? Exactly, exactly. There's, so we're having this conversation because we don't want the world. I don't want this world. I, I, this, this is not a way for all of our children and all of our grandchildren. That's why we're having this courageous conversation. So I do want to put out there that, you know, um, it should be mandatory reading to white to read white fragility. That should be mandatory reading, you know, for white people right now to really start challenging the narratives. You know, why do you think that way? And why, why, and, and I and I, I appreciate you guys getting on the line. And you know, when Monica and I started this, all of us started it, but we when we talked about, you know, who moderates and, and how do we have this conversation, 
you know, Monica, if you remember, you're like, it's not up to me to teach you about racism, right? Like the fact that we, I exited the Montgomery County public school system and, and, and have, you know, I don't need somebody else to do my education about racism. It's my personal responsibility to do my own work about racism. And, uh, you know, I, I bump into it all the time in the Medicare for All content. We are watching the African and our black and brown families dying exponentially in the pandemic right now because of policies because the majority of the Congress is white. They know exactly what they're doing. It's a crime against humanity to not give everybody access to healthcare right now. And we're all watching that. We're watching that. Yes, I mean, everybody has got to call their congressperson right now and tell them to sign. There are two Medicare for all bills on the table. You know, it's that. And people sit back and they go, no, nope, I'm okay. You know, I got my insurance. I don't want to derail us, but it's an example. It's an example exactly. of Here's- white privilege and then not doing anything because I got mine and you're going to have to go get yours. And there is no equal footing here to go get quote yours because it's just not even available. Uh, so, so we need to talk I just about wanted to, can yeah. I just there was a question on Facebook I just wanted I saw it so I just want to put it out there because actually someone had a question and Joanna asked um, from an educational education perspective what does it take to help to heal the trauma so whether that's for now or for next time you know she was throwing that question out so I noticed it and I thought we would can I just, out there. Because this is a healthcare issue, right? You can't get, you can't get access to mental health care. And that's where it's the trauma, um, a lot of that needs to be processed, not only in the education system to, you know, um, well, ever educate um, us. The fact that we're still producing racists after all these years out of our school systems is just horrifying. But wait, we're, we're not even that. in the right ballpark yet. We are still talking about the patriarchal monarchy system that exists within the United States. You know, all men are created equal really meant only white men. And so when we're talking about health care, we're talking about a white male um, organization who's constructed, well, I've got my health care. Women, uh, black and brown people, sorry, you guys have different issues. Even if we look at the op- reopening of the state of Maryland, some old white guy grandfather age said, okay, we're going to reopen. And my first thought was, what are we going to do about daycare? We're, nobody talks about what affects women. And as women, why are women compl- white women complicit? Because we can't even stand up to men because we're still under that, what, yeah. waiting for the offerings. And what we have got to do is grab the hands join our hearts and grab the hands of every brown and black skinned mother out there. May I interrupt and say that we have four minutes left. And uh, I just wanted to get in a a couple of actual important announcements. COVID-19 Healthline 410-222-7256. And on Monday, May 18, there is a pop-up testing site at the Boys and Girls Club at Freetown Village, 7820, Daryl Henry Court in Pasadena from 10 to 11 a.m. There's also another pop-up site in Pasadena at uh, uh, Riviera Beach Library, 1130 Duval Highway, and also another pop-up site at Robinwood Community Center, 1469 Tyler Avenue in Annapolis, Maryland at 10 a.m. The site at Riviera Beach Library is from 12 noon until 1 p.m. There's also a grocery store uh, uh, ride or transportation set up by the Kingdom Celebration Center. uh, And you call 410-672-2006. Don't forget food distribution uh, sites are set up tomorrow at uh, Kingdom Celebration Center, 1350 Blair Road in Odenton and also at Empowering Believers Church, 7566 East Howard Road. Thanks, everyone. So, Claudia, let's talk about that. Those pop-up sites are only open for an hour. Yes. One hour. Think about how long it takes when you have to get the swab. I mean, 
it's criminal how we are treating people in this pandemic, but how we do as a society here in the US. Um, one hour is comical and they need to go back. It's to not the enough. It's not it's enough. Not enough. It's yeah. not enough. And we have to say this in a live stream video. What are exactly. all the people doing that we pay with our tax dollars, right? From the health department. Who actually can put that out with a straight face? That's the problem. Well, and if I could just quickly say that like this pandemic, and we've all pointed this out, that this pandemic didn't create the problems that we're seeing. Those problems were always there. The pandemic has just made them more stark. And it's almost infuriating at this point to see how inflexible certain figures have been in this. If people, if they wanted to keep the sites open for longer than an hour, they could. If they wanted to try to reach out to local businesses to see how they can help them, to assist them and to co coordinate with them to create more programs for the summer that would be safe from a social distancing standpoint, they could. They're just so stuck in that archaic system and they're comfortable there because we're still in a system that lets them be. And so it's infuriating, but um, that's why we're here is to try and make progress again and push back against that. So, ladies, Holly, were you going to say much. something? Let's do some final comments here um, because it is I have a final and we want to wrap up. So we're going to go around do final comments. Uh, I'll um, go first. And thing that we didn't get to cover was uh, Lieutenant Richard Collins the third. Uh, we are coming up on the anniversary of his death, unfortunately, May 20th. Um, also soon will, um, uh, there, there's a, a, a trial, um, the, the court case is coming up. I believe that's on June 5th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I did wanna mention that there is a Facebook page for the uh, Lieutenant Richard Collins III Facebook page. Um, if you, foundation, if you can like that, um, please do. So. Uh, ladies, mm -hmm. our final comments. Yasmin. Um, you. I can say that there was another question also that we can think about for next time. How can white women help? That's, you know, like we just kind of this whole discussion today was kind of like, where are the, you know, white people, but where are the women? And for me specifically with the local case with, um, Second Lieutenant um, Richard Collins the third. Where's the Smyrna Park neighbors and and the and the mom of the murder? Where you know, we I would love to actually go over there and do some interviewing. So that mm -hmm. might be coming next. Yeah. But thank you, everybody. And that that's where I am as well. I I think we can work more on discussing what can white women do? And um, I think I was talking about an idea we had for an upcoming show where we have some white women with differing views on racism. And if they could just have listened to this show and it, hopefully it did transcribe, I'd love to send that to a few people that I'm thinking of who I'd like to hear this. Mm -hmm. yep. So, uh, last week we talked about when we see racism and profiling in retail shops to, uh, you know, take out your camera, um, ask the person if it's okay to help support them and to go ahead and take the video if we see the profiling and then to post, uh, post that and then boycott that location. So that, that came out of last week. This week, um, challenging, um, you know, white people, white women in particular, to read White Fragility. It's in the audio book. You can hear it for free from the Anne Arundel County Library. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, take the time to do the homework so that we can stop the cycle. We can break through this denial and we can actually step, stop the generational pain that we are inflicting on um, our brothers and sisters and our, and and um, you know, stop the cycle. So also third and final is uh, 
anybody's welcome to join this conversation. Just send us a note in Facebook, uh, send us a note at Arundel Patriot because we want this to be a big conversation. We're just getting started. So uh, thanks very much for joining us today. So I would like to add to that as a white woman, what can you do? Grab your son, grab your brother, grab your life partner and have an open conversation with them about racism when you see it. Bring it to the table, bring it to them. It was our job to educate our sons when they were little. That job doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. We have the power, we have the numbers, we have the time. Use that time wisely and, and show compassion and love to all of our brown and black skin sisters who are losing their children because of our silence mm -hmm. on racial mm -hmm. bias. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the last one, I, I, you know what, you guys, I'm at, at a loss for words right now. <laughs> I really am. I, you guys hit on some really, good, really, really good points. Um, I think the only thing for me right now is, is the narrative aspect of all of this is how do we, I'm at a point now to where I recognize that my community has to be unapologetic in its walk. We're in this place where it's time for us to be very unapologetic in, in, in our walk um, and to not buy into these narratives because for far too long, we've been allowing people to tell our narrative for us. And it is our responsibility to um, snatch that back and to be unapologetic with it and to not allow this system to keep controlling us. And I think in regards to our white counterparts that it is their responsibility to step up and to start holding each other accountable because it's not our job. And for far too long, we've taken on that burden when we shouldn't have. And we did it because we're a peaceful people. That's why we did it. We're a peaceful people. Um, but if this, can, this country wants to continue to exist, then it is going to take white people being bold you know, and stepping outside of the shadows and walking unapologi unapologetically in their own way in regards to what that looks like with dismantling racism and, 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 and have to do it. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, we do it, we do it with fear, but we do it fearlessly. And I think that's what white people are gonna have to start doing too. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Monica. <laughs> Whoops. Emma, did you have parting words? Um, just thank you so much for letting me be a part of this conversation. I have grown a lot as a result of being a part of this community um, and have been able to examine my own privilege. And that's something that I would like to continue working on. And um, I would just like to add that I am from Severna Park and um, I live there currently and I have a lot of thoughts and feelings. Not only that, but I went to high school with the monster that murdered Lieutenant Richard Collins III. And so I feel a huge responsibility to continue challenging myself and how I learned to have and, and how I am seen by the world and how I treat others and especially um, people of color. And so uh, thank you for teaching me and I hope that I can continue to be a part of this conversation and grow. Excellent. Thank you, Emma, for joining today. Thank you, Bye. Emma. Thank you. Claudia, any, any closing remarks? And we'll go ahead and- I, I was impressed with uh, what Carmen said uh, in, her, in her closing remarks because she hit the nail on the head when she mentioned about uh, parents uh, uh, bringing in your, your son, your brother, uh, and so on, because oftentimes uh, uh, students that attend Severna Park High School, they're on the receiving end because I, uh, it has been brought up in many NAACP uh, complaints that um, on the regular uh, African-American students that attend that school uh, are on the receiving end of, of uh, racial slurs like the N-word. Uh, on a regular basis. Wow. And to that extent, there has got to be change. There has got to be that conversation 
to bring it up and say, why are you doing that? They need to have conversations as to what's going on at that school on a regular basis. And it's right. not just that school, it's Chesapeake uh, Middle School and mm -hmm. it's other schools in Anne Arundel County. And that has to be brought up and, and addressed. Thank you all. Yeah. I just and, have a couple of announcements. Yeah. I just have a couple of announcements before we go. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of events that are coming up. One is Saturday. Um, it's, it's a benefit. Uh, we're partnering with a lot of different nonprofits. It's um, hopefully everybody can join. It'll be through Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, it's gonna raise money for like five different nonprofits addressing um, substance use abuse, um, the domestic violence, gun violence, homelessness, just uh, I can you know send you the information, but that's gonna be from like noon until 10 o'clock at night. It's like almost like a telethon. Um, and then we also May 25th, Chris Wilson, who wrote the master plan, um, is going to be interviewed by um, um, Tola Ajayi on May 25th at seven o'clock. Um, and also, again, a reminder for everybody to join um, and join Arundel Patriot and give what you can at Patri uh, Let's see, what is Monica? Do you have the um, your back? Do you have I, um, yeah, the yeah, little in? technical difficulties there? But yes, yeah, you have the link for that. For yeah, the Patreon, Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com, become a monthly supporter of the Arundel Patriot. I also just want to um, add to the list of events that on June second, that's June second from six to eight p.m. We will be live streaming on the Arundel Arundel, Arundel Patriot, the uh, COVID nineteen Summer Town Hall, which will be presenting opportunities for youth uh, ages preschool through 18 years old. What will be available during a COVID summer? These are activities that will be recognizing social distancing and opportunities still for the youth to be able to uh, reshape their summer in light of, um, we know we're not gonna have public pools and those kind of things, but these are activities um, that youth would be able to participate to replace those. Okay. And we have one more event on the Arundel Patriot this Thursday night at seven o'clock. It's uh, hosted by, co-hosted with the Maryland Progressive Healthcare Coalition called How Can I Get Healthcare? So I hope you all will join us. We have some experts that are going to be coming on the line uh, to talk about what's currently going on in the healthcare. So we'll see you at the Arundel Patriot at seven o'clock on Thursday night. I believe that's the 25th, 21st of May. Thank you. All right, and thank you for joining STAR, Straight Talk About Racism, Navigating to a Better World Without Racism. Carmen has something. <laughs> oh, sorry, Carmen. Can I just add one more? Um, on Wednesday, May 20th, the COVID-19 in the Native American communities is doing a live stream as well. Um, to include Rep. Uh, Deb Holland, um, oh. State Rep. Ruth Buffalo, Tara Guska, um, and Faith Spotted Eagle. I'm here in New Mexico right now on the Navajo Reservation, and we have the highest numbers in the nation per capita of, of positive cases and deaths. I'm just mm. saying, if we're looking from a nationwide perspective, please say, keep a prayer for the Navajo, Navajo and Hopi. Mm. Thank you. We will indeed, we will. And uh, we uh, definitely invite you all to share your voice. Um, Straight Talk About Racism is open for people to send in their questions and concerns, as well as we would love to have you on, a get, on as a guest to join our conversation uh, Sundays at 2 p.m. on the Rundle Patriot. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we enjoyed getting beyond the basic bullshit. You ladies have a great day and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye everybody.